All right. Bill, would you say again what you, you just said? Because I missed it, that, that the, the gender, the gender uh, allocation of, of sky gods and right. the woman is the recipient, the male and the female, that, that's a recurrent myth in many, many religions. Yes, uh, Babylonian myth, for example. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, it, um, um speaks about that. Um, but, uh, but, but, but in your presentation, it's, it's largely the distinction that's um, that's brought to the fore. Yeah. Whereas um, there are lots of, uh, I was thinking about this as I was reading it because yes, we want to distinguish them, make them clear. But on yeah. the other hand, there's much history, rich history about the interaction between the two. And yeah. that's just one instance. So no, the, the, the only person up until that time who brought gender in to the phenomenological circle was Shaler. Mm. Uh, he wrote a horrible essay by modern standards uh, characterizing uh, uh, women and men's differences in terms of uh, the uh, uh, characterizing the woman as a, uh, embodying the plant. I just, there we go, okay. And, and, the, uh, and the, the male as the animal, the agent, and the woman, the passive receptive. And of course, that would today couldn't get off the ground and be a target of enormous uh, and appropriate ridicule. Uh, but it did represent something of perhaps about uh, fashionable, uh, implicit un uh, uh, images or versions of, of in the 1920s, in the early part of the 20th century. Of, 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 of in a patriarchal society of, of gender differences. Well, um, I see I see the, those manifested every time I I see a 1950s movie or a 1950s TV show. Obviously, TV is more conservative, but even in movies, it's pretty plain um, that that kind of imagery is um, in place. No, no, no. It's 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 the. Uh, the, 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 you had the woman as the belonging to the household, you know, and she took, she was nurturing and she, she didn't make a way in the world. She didn't have to, what her job wasn't to make, her, her calling wasn't to make a way in the world, you know, uh, and to leave and leave the home. She was the homemaker and the, the, uh, the, the male was uh, the person who had to go out and, and quasi in a hunter gatherer way, you know, bring, uh, 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 what were the material necessities of home by conquest and so forth. Mm -hmm. and well, so but that theme is very is slightly different than the way you describe heaven and earth, because um, the home can be viewed as, as the earth, meaning the firm, the firmness, the foundation. And, and the man in this picture is, um, is set loose in some sense and unstable. <laughs> In fact, that's Gilder's notion. Remember Gilder in the 90s? Oh. That he needed to be civilized. Um, and um, But that's not exactly what you mean by the heavens, um, I don't think. Mm -hmm. um, well, there's Matt's here. Hi, Matt. OK. Hi, everybody. So I mean, this this reading today, the unearthing of heaven phenomenology and the unearthing of heaven really cool title by the way um is is fairly short maybe we can kind of tackle it um by sections so um in the first section we are not really talking about hans voss yet um the first section is is just a few pages, seven, one, heaven and earth as categories of worldly experience. I'm not suggesting that this be the structure of today's discussion, but um, well, I mean, okay, I'm suggesting it, but I'm not insisting, you know, we can we can take it wherever, of course. But um, since it's such a short reading, it might be good to kind of guide us in this way. I guess this is where um, these categories are brought in connection with Husserl, especially with 
his famous, um, now quite famous essay, um, uh, the, the original, originary arc, the earth does not move. I, can I ask a, a question about something that's in 7-1, right on the second page of the chapter? <clears throat> something that uh, I found the, the very helpful, surprising, and <clears throat> almost embarrassingly so. And it's the way, Jim, uh, the way that you described the nature of horizon from a phenomenological perspective. <clears throat> and what you say is, and I'm so grateful to you for it, <clears throat> you say, uh, and I'm reading on 2.18, uh, for Husserl, every perception of an object was accompanied by a periphery or fringe of meaning given along with the object. Thus, quote, context, close quote, or quote, horizon, close quote, of meaning was not given, but given with. The horizon is the circumference of the focus of attention. The given thing has a halo of potential perceptions surrounding the uh, meaning of the focal center. Um, and what struck me uh, for the first time with resonance is going back to the reading we did of Schultz when Barber was with us, um, is the location of horizon in a world of meanings, which is not unrealistically uh, considered to be the world of language. That is to say, these things are in language, which is a separate place to be from being in image. So that in the, it moves the, it, at least it moves my metaphorical structure away from perception to uh, thought and to find then horizon, which has, we've been talking about from the very beginning, because it's so fundamental to all phenomenology, to find that to be a linguistic constraint or a linguistic limit or a linguistic uh, horizon rather than a perceptual horizon, I found to be just really a strong shaking of my way of thinking about what we're doing here. Now, I'll, I'll immediately re, you know, shut up if nobody else uh, has any sense of like, well, what the hell is Gordon talking about now? Uh, uh, and, uh, but I just wanted to get that out there because I've, I've found that for me, the concept of horizon has always been puzzling. And yet phenomenologists use it and we have used it as if, well, everybody knows what that means. And uh, I've never really felt comfortable with it. And I found this placing of it in a linguistic frame, in a semantic frame, to be very helpful. Oh, good. Good. Yeah. Well, I'm glad. <laughs> But am I is is am I just uh, off here in the universe of my own? No, or? I don't think so. I think I think you're I, you're making me think about the appropriateness and the legitimacy of it. Uh, I'll just say uh, uh, briefly that uh, you're absolutely right. It seems to me to come from a uh, 
the uh, kind of pre-linguistic or tacitly ling linguistic realm, which is the, which is the perceptual. And but we the the this raises all sorts of wonderful questions, Gordon, in terms of the relationship between perception and language. But, you, but uh, towards the end of your remarks, you, you 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 talked about semantics, and I think that's closer. That that makes the the, the transition a little more uh, uh, easy because with the perceptual is soaked with meaning, hmm? and usually uh, pre-linguistic, at least in the sense that it's it's pre-propositional, pre-spoken, and so forth, and that is a much more fluid realm in, in the sense that you don't have the marked boundaries that you have with words and divided up in, the, in terms of nouns and, and, and verbs and sub -predic, uh, uh, subjects and predicates and modifiers and, and relative clauses and so forth and so on, where you have distinct units. But I, I think, you know, I, I don't know, you know, I think that I just can't remember right now uh, where, where he might have, you know, himself discussed this issue. But I think the, uh, that, that you, 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 you put all of phenomenology, uh, right, uh, uh, bring it all into one framework right here with raising this question. I, uh, I, I use as a synonym for horizon context, that which is quasi-linguistic, certainly semantic. And you have the, what the given with is hinted at in the word context, you have the, along with the text, that which is con is the, is the anglicized version of the Latin cum. Uh, which is the given with, the context with, the text with, which, and that's what a context with, what surrounds or what given with the text. And in the you know, early 19th, uh, 20th century, we got familiar with this whole theme of, of, uh, of horizon and in other language and Gestalt psychology, we had foregrounds and backgrounds and had William James, of course, in the turn of the century with the fringe of meaning. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is it is semantic, and I dare say it's uh, it's linguistic, in the sense that you 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 have linguistic fields, uh, uh, not only in, in terms of the psychological phenomenon of association, but uh, words always call up. Uh, most words, at any rate, on most occasions, call up a context, mm -hmm. and and a, a and then we have a uh, a sentence which is given even more so. You know, uh, we'd say this is out of the blue, and we need. I need more words. I need more sentences to make sense out of this sentence. So it's not utterly foreign, but I think that the the uh, uh, what what Husserl is touching on with this notion of horizon in this sense, say moving merely from, from the merely perceptual and tacitly linguistic and pre-linguistic and pre-propositional and so forth to the full-blown realm of, of, of language and semantics, he's pointing to a neglected theme that he doesn't only, only talked about later in a few passages for me, which I, and, and I come to this find very richly exposed in a, uh, a 19th century Italian thinker uh, that Jeremy perhaps has mentioned on a case, and Antonio Rosmini, he was a remarkable uh, a priest who's now a Beatus, uh, Beatus and, but when I came across him as a seminarian, he was a suspect, a heretic. Uh, but he founded two religious orders and so forth and so on. That's all irrelevant, basically. But he had a rich sense of a pre grasp or a, uh, of the mind being constituted by a notion of being. And he even called this a divine notion because it left nothing out, because being doesn't leave anything out. And I think that that's, that's the, the way of thinking about spirit, mind is spirit. That it's in, in, Arist in Aristotle's sense, it's coda modo omnia, or as the Latins would put it, it is in a certain sense everything. The, the mind is, has a potentiality, a eros, a dynamism towards everything, towards being as such. And so I think that uh, what Husserl did for me uh, when I first came across that he awakened this old Thomas side of me because you have something like that in St. Thomas already, that the first thing that comes across the mind is being, that you have the sense then, it, we never have uh, the atomistic or the positivist view of the universe that we, we kind of stare mutely and dumbly at it, and we come across you know, one thing, we're always in it, or always soaked with the whole, whole range of being 
when, when we're awake. And, and there's this, and the, the mind is a, a, one of my favorite uh, uh, Thomists of the 20th century, the, the Canadian Bernard Lonergan used to say, we have this note, the mind is the notion of being. It is this desire for being absolutely to be grasped in an intuitive judgment, which has never happened in this life. So I think this would be a way of, and this, I think Husserl is saying this, which is that notion of the world as the horizon of horizons. Hmm? And, and but we we willy nilly frame things in in uh, in gen, in species and genuses as kinds of horizons. A, 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 a dog is in within the species of not only canine but animal. And plants we get singled out. So these are all kind of meaning horizons. Which, if we grasp something as something, right away we have this application of horizon and horizon of horizons there at work. Now we, and this is true of children. They're, this is how they're framing the world. They're carving up the world. They're dividing the world. They're articulating the world. And I think that this, uh, but I'm so delighted you, you, uh, uh, you know, you found all those connections there. But it, and I, I do think it's all the phenomenology is tucked into your remarks, Gordon. Well, I, <clears throat> the, the reason that it struck, one of the reasons that it struck me very powerfully when I read it was the things that I'm wrestling with in, in my own work. Mm. Uh, Tell us what that is, Gordon. Oh, no, no, please. No, be careful what you ask for, because- uh, How your, about five sentences? Yeah, your, your, your heads would hit the desktop, you know, so quickly. The, uh, let, let me just try to, sh to shortcut it. I'm, I'm supposed to be writing a book about religion, and the first chapter, is about reality and the second chapter is about truth. Uh -huh. And I make a very particular kind of distinction that this is very, that this horizon thing is totally relevant to because I noticed at a certain point that very traditional philosophers of religion and I'm thinking about uh, Swinburne, uh, write, for example, a book called The Coherence of Theism. And he's on for about 400 pages on, you know, on the coherence of theism. And I've watched him in Oxford debates, debating atheists, for example. And he has this serene certainty that God is a person. Well, now we must start with the notion that God is a person and his serenity, his certainty in that oral presentation would lead you to believe that the sense of truth he believes he's expressing is a correspondence truth. That is to say that he has some sense of God that goes beyond a coherence theory of truth. But his book at great length limits itself, and I think correctly, to coherence theory. Namely, <clears throat> that theism is coherent, which means we can make a coherent linguistic frame for theism. But by, by limiting it to a coherent theory of truth, a coherence theory of truth, he simply finesses or dodges all questions of correspondence. Namely, whether if you got it out of the hum human linguistic framework, you'd have anything left at all. And so it, it, it seems to me that, that uh, this notion of horizon, which seems to drive us toward a, a perceptual thing, something that is possible of verification or falsification without language uh, is not what a horizon is in phenomenology. Phenomenology has its, uh, right at this very core concept, the notion of a, a if, I'm, if I'm doing it right, a noetic component, namely a component that, the, that one brings rather than what is brought 
what the self is bringing and what we bring right. is language. So I, again, I apologize for taking the time. Well, but, it's wonderful, uh, it's wonderful. And uh, that's Husserl, this is all Husserl. What you're, this Husserl would not subscribe to a coherent theory of truth because you'd have you know, a matter of, uh, of uh, juxtaposing and integrating and harmonizing finished propositions. Uh, but the whole theme of truth, Husserl, is, in, is this noetic realm of the truth is inseparably a noetic matter because it's always tied to the filling of intentions. So, so propositions become true because the proposition is something that's proposed for our belief in the absence of a confirming, verifying proposition, unless it's an analytic proposition, unless it's a, a, a predicate which you know is, is staying again the subject. Uh, but if you say it's raining outside, that's you know that's not going to be solved analytically. Uh, but you're going to have to look out the window or go outside. So if someone says it's raining. I said you per perceive something that namely the rain in its absence in an unfilled way in an empty way. You stick your neck out, stick your head out. You get wet. That's the filling of that intention. And that's not merely a uh, a uh, 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 theory of truth. Yeah. So and. And he has some really, in, uh, 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 I'm going to be quite out of but I've come across in the, the, the Husserliana volume 42, some, some really interesting quasi-theological, but the idea of truth, which is very Augustinian in these passages of, uh, of Husserl, uh, where the, 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 the way the mind is informed by this interest in truth and, and uh, it's, and it, it heads towards, it, it inf informs all of, uh, finite, uh, filled intentions, but it heads towards an infinite, infinity of truth. Uh, and it needs a, a divine mind, and you're implying a divine mind in being a human mind, because you have to have a, an infinite mind to, to be adequate to correspond with the, the in, infinity of the intention of truth, which is constitutive of, 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 of the human consciousness. So yeah. these are all marvelous uh, themes, Gordon. Well, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, this is uh, what keeps me uh, crazy. Yeah. Just this, this, <laughs> this, I know the feeling. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, and, and um, I, I, it seems to me that when I confront a, a theist as committed as many of you are and confront my, my appreciation of Swinburne, another committed theist, uh, I'm back and forth between, I mean, I keep on asking the epistemological question, how do you know that? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know it, I'm not dumb. So it's not really a question of intelligence. Mm -hmm. So what do you know? And how did you get there? And what gives you that confidence? Mm -hmm. Why aren't we all just totally beset by doubt? But then you realize that doubt, what kind of doubt are you talking about? Are you talking about doubt in the sense that you cannot talk in a way that makes sense, a coherence view? In other words, it's just word salad. Or do, do you mean doubt in the sense that if that there is something to be perceived that I'm not perceiving? And, and, and is one to look in or out? And what's the difference between in and out? This, of course, is all through Asian religion and Asian philosophy, the, the lack of distinction between in and out. Uh, that's Mahayana Buddhism. It is just eradicating that distinction. Um, so yeah, this is what drives me crazy. And when I, uh, uh, and in, in this group where I know I, that there are in this group people of, of deep and abiding faith. And, uh, and, I, and I have this sense that what grounds that is what allows one to take 
to have a lot of fun with things like the Epirian and like these very convoluted intellectual uh, constructions in German of, of all things, in, in German with extended attributes of five and six and seven adjectives preceding the noun. Uh, that, uh, that's, a, how to put it, the deep and abiding faith is there independent of all that, but gives one the freedom to play with all that stuff without worrying about it because it doesn't matter where it comes out because it's not the ground of the religiosity to begin with. Uh, the, and if, if I want to do force, I want to get to the, I want to get to the ground of religion. In, in fact, not, not already have it and then put it in my pocket and go do Germanic philosophy. Uh, which is not going to change my mind a single bit about the relationship, about who Jesus was and about the nature of the resurrection where all the action is, uh, etc. So how, you know, how does the, you know, the, the apiron, uh, aper, well, however it's pronounced, and all of, of HCM's extraordinary verbal work, does it just lead to a coherence? Or, or is the germ of that correspondence in there somewhere? And I don't have a clue. Not a clue. Gordon, I'd like to <clears throat> say something because I have thought a lot about this myself. Um, to what you just said, and I think it's an extraordinarily important and fascinating subject. More than fascinating, <laughs> um, important. Um, and so the story, I, I, my first thought, I was listening to you, led me to remember, um, I think it's Hansen's um, description of Kepler um, in the, what is it called, Patterns of, Ev Patterns of Evidence, Patterns of something, I can't remember, um, Burton in the 50s. And he talks about um, Kepler um, examining this data that had been around for eons um, and the description of the planets. And, um, and that this um, revelation, uh, I don't mean that um, as theolo theologically, um, that came to him when he realized that, um, that all the data fell in place into ellipses. When the, when the planets were regarded as ellipses that circled the sun, all the data fell in place. Uh, that's the coherence. But that's also the, um, it also is that coherence that all this sense of things falling into place is what um, provides him this sense of truthfulness. So it isn't, it isn't just coherence like in Hegelian, as Kierkegaard likes to make fun of Hegel. Um, it's not building, um, pyramids or castles in the sky. It's founded upon the, the evidence that, um, that we could generally agree upon. And then it falling into place in, um, in an invisible sense, meaning that the, what, what, what's binding it together is invisible. Um, and th that gives you the sense of, uh, a sense of truthfulness. And I would say that um, religion, having a religion is the same thing as having a world. Um, and that um, it, it's, the, it's, the, it's the concept of world that has fascinated me since I first uh, studying uh, phenomenology. In fact, I think Sokolowski makes a big deal about this. And it is something that's undeniable, but it's the very notion of having a world that is fundamental to, I think, having a religion. Uh, that's, oh, and <laughs> I have one more comment, then I'll stop. And that is because we originally started talking your your um, discussion about this this passage in Jim's text, and so I was thinking about that as you were talking, and I really think that it's and I think I agree more with what Jim was saying, but I think there's such a thing as um, perceptual um, horizons, and um, which 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 feels itself closer to gestalts, and these are not linguistic. That, but there are things that are, the things can be bound together in some coherence and they don't have to be linguistic, um, but um, there's closer to Gestalt, which is again, this notion of having the world. Well, thank you. Well, 
Well, no, I'm done. I, go ahead, Gord. No, no, I, no, no. I, no, I, I I'm don't done. hearing. I, I don't hear Bill for some reason. Of course, I'm getting old, but uh, if someone could put it, put Bill said in a sentence or two, I'd be grateful. Uh, I, I just didn't quite get the. Uh, I, I, I was just. I, my my earring is often muffled. Um, I can, I'll just say it briefly, and that is that uh, I was reminding um, Gordon of Kepler and his, um, and his um, revelation of the planets um, re re revolving around the um, sun in ellipses, which is always I, I still didn't hear that, uh, Bill. The, the, whose revelation of what? Kepler. 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 Ah, okay, got it. <laughs> And his and his uh, his revelation vis-a-vis -vis the the uh, his pri his predecessors. Okay, right. And that and that the experience of all the data falling into place is the is the is the um, phenomenological experience. I want to emphasize. Yeah, yeah. I I I think if uh, my 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 sense is that. For the individual, as as James William James said, in his solitude, uh, comes completely to grips with mortality and experiences the death of loved ones. Um. The engagement with religion is the what what it means to be engaged with the religion is exactly to be able to it um, uh, I I can only I have to I have to do it I I have to do it. Uh, literarily, in John Magus's, uh, uh, sorry, John Fowles' book, The Magus, the Nazis have captured a Greek island and they've rounded up all the partisans. <clears throat> and one partisan is completely resistant to everything the Nazis do to him, which includes some awful tortures. And finally, he's in front of the firing squad. And the only word he utters is the Greek word for freedom. I, I, it's Eleutheria or something like that. I don't know how to pronounce Greek. <clears throat> so this man, no matter what, he utters that word. And they kill him. To me, that was, although it seemed we would not necessarily see that in a theistic context, to me, it was essentially a religious act. It cut all the way through. It went beyond. It tra it transcended any any naysaying. What one is willing to die for. Moreover, what one is willing to die for, as if in triumph is religious engagement in its purest ultimate form. So that physics is not going to change that guy's mind about anything having to do with what is ultimate. And certainly not Husserl or Conrad Marius, or the blessed Edith Stein. None of those 
where they are is not where that guy was or where ultimate religious commitment is. It is exactly that which is transcendent. I will die for this. And of course, symbolizing that is Jesus, who not only died, but knew he was going to die and knew why he was going to die. and accepted that heroically. So Gordon, I, I completely 100% agree with you. That's why I find um, religious expression every day by people that claim to not be religious. I, I hear it all the time. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to jump in. Um, I know, Bill, I think you mentioned Kierkegaard and I think that there's, he, so he's got the distinction between objective and subjective truth. And about the person who relies on objective truth, um, the religious person, for instance, who relies on objective truth, I remember that he said something about how you could fit everything into a coherent picture, um, but then the moment before you die, some fact pops up, some fact appears that all of a sudden throws the entire picture into a different relief, right? And you're in trouble if that's the foundation of, of your religious belief. And um, so then, you know, comes this really famous notion of subjective truth and um, and a more existential notion of truth, which I think, Gordon, is sort of what's coming out in your story. Um, but then I think that one of the things that's so, I mean, as as sort of, um, you know, if you're if you're a person who has religious faith, I think that it's probably grounded in something like that, or at least has something to do with something like that. It's about meaning and it's about ultimate meaning horizons for human beings. But then there's, um, I think there's also a kind of compulsion to 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 reason the faith and to to reason about the faith and to reason about what it means to be faithful um, and to have faith and and to be a theist or to be you know even um, um, and, and Conrad Marty is his con, uh, context of Christian. And one of the things that I think that I find really attractive about Conrad Martius and about, uh, you know, even people around Conrad Martius is the, um, is that it, it makes it possible to not be embarrassed about, um, intellectual implications of the faith in some way. So for instance, if you're talking about um, heaven and earth or the ascension or the assumption or anything like this, it gives you a kind of different horizon rather than, you know, um, maybe a kind of fairy tale horizon that might be suggested to you to put that in. And so there's a kind of, um, you know, there's a kind of um, support and that, uh, if you want to say it that way. And then there's also, I mean, you could also look at it as a way, like, um, in, in Heidegger's sense of like, denken as danken, as thinking as giving thanks or something like that. And you could have, you could, you could think about um, vocational thinking or vocation, philosophy as vocation, whereas you could conceive of it within sort of like your, your own religious belief and how you sort of return the gift is to think the gift in a sense how you return the gift of creation is to think through creation so, you know it could be this really sacramental act that um is not is kind of not you know doesn't have to necessarily be a kind of last ditch effort to put everything together so that it all makes sense but as a way of saying thank you you know in a sense you know yes, i feel yeah, absolutely like a way of of of, of yeah. you know of, um you know, of, of loving creation in a sense to think it. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, I thank you, thank you for that. It's beautiful, and I I, I agree completely with you. And when I I mean uh, I know that, that Randy teaches you know the medievalists and he teaches the Neoplatonists and so on. And I admire Randy. I admire your scholarship on this so much. The one person in that very 
very large philosophical arena that I know much more about is Kusa, you know, Kusanas, because it seems to me that the higher, in the concept of the higher ignorance, we have this uh, theme that Matt, I think I, that I heard you express, be, <laughs> it, it, it seemed to me that it is beyond rationality, and yet it's our nature, it's our human nature to attempt to make sense. And, and it seemed to me that what Nicholas teaches is, okay, but don't get carried away with yourself. The, the, the idea that somehow you're going to prove something is hubris. And it is learning to live in your ignorance faithfully. That, that is the task. And I, I hope that's what Nicholas of Cusa is teaching, uh, because I really, uh, uh, I need that. I need somebody to have said it. I'm not smart enough to say it in Latin, but somehow if you can say it in Latin, you get extra points for it. So, you know, so I'll, I'll borrow whoever said it in Latin or Greek. Um, but and in among recent theolog theologians, it seems to me that Tillich, with the notion of correctly understood of ultimate concern gets, gets there. He gets to that place, but you really have to think very or, or feel your way through the notion of ultimacy that's at stake. This just isn't, well, I care about this more than I care about anything else. So that's my issue of ultimate concern. And then you get people as, for example, some, some, uh, critic um, writing that I uh, had had floating about with a publisher uh, said, well, Vermont using Tillich's thing of ultimate concern, that just makes everybody religious. Well, that's silly. That's silly. I mean, the fact that, that someone really likes chocolate more than vanilla uh, is not a matter of ultimate concern. Uh, and I think so. He, I, this critic of my work, uh, who was anonymous, of course, uh, um, just trivialized Tillich and trivialized the notion of ultimate concern uh, and didn't have a clue what I was trying to do. Um, uh, but that's, that's my problem, <laughs> to make myself clearer. So, okay, I'm done. I'm done. There's love, you know. Thank you. Thank you for thank you for asking the question, but I warned you, Jim. I warned you. <laughs> I would I would like to get um well, I don't think we've strayed really that far from the text, but um, believe it or not. But um I would like to explore something which um Jim suggests. I hope you can hear me, Jim. Um um, and I don't think um, is explored enough in the text. And that is this notion that um, heaven and earth are um, necessary elements of any world, any world. Um, and so um, I, I'd like to, if we have the chance, to at least try to think about, um, because I kept on putting in the, putting notes, little notes in, in Jim's text, about, yes, that's true in um, some worlds, maybe in a Christian world, but in other worlds, it may not be. So, um, um, but, but I think, for example, um, actually Gordon um, brought this issue up, um, perhaps unknowingly, um, when he talked to, uh, when he spoke of the um, person in Fowler's um, novel, because in some sense, the heaven, is this thing which is transcends the heavens are transcendent, and the very notion that he has no notion of something that transcends the earth, um, probably we're going to say 
reflects this um, dichotomy that we appear to have um, resonant in all our worlds. That is between the heaven and the earth. Um, anyway, that's my suggestion. Um, I just want to point out that for that, the distinction in footnote four on page 219 is really important. Um, and that is between the singular world and the plural worlds. This is a, a stipulation. This is added on here, um, but I think the way it, it is applied um, works in the text, but I think it also um, has a certain implication for the, the bigger, broader discussion um, today of um, like the, on the one hand, the semantics of possible worlds, and on the other hand, the, um, the like the Everett interpretation, the, the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. For, for example, I think these are just two familiar contexts within which the concept of other possible universes or other possible worlds might appear. Um, so, so let me just point this out, that on page 219, there's this footnote four. Now above the footnote in the text, it's um, a footnote to the, the first paragraph. Um, and I, I, I do want us to, to look at this, to stay on this topic. Let me just share the screen here. Um, sorry, wrong, oops, that's not it. Good, good Randy, this is exactly the, the comment I wanted just to refer to, so oh. good. Oh, excellent, okay, here, here we go. Um, uh, it keeps giving me this other, no, that is right. Okay, sorry. Sorry, one sec. Um, sorry, my my um my text is is highlighted, um, and then it was covered up by the uh, the other functions. Okay, two nineteen. Let me go there. Sorry. <clears throat> well, I can read it if you want me to. Yeah, did, did this one right, right, right about here. Well, it begins with world is constituted out of. Yeah, I thought we'd we'd have a look at that and then jump down. Um, here, I, I can read it. it. It just says, um, world is constituted out of the sedimented ground of unobjective intention of the real in terms of all possible experience. And then the footnote, um, probably to this concept of possible experience, right? Down here, note that we must distinguish world from worlds. The latter are regions of meaning within world. And in this sense, games, novels, etc. right? Literature, movies, TV series <laughs> um, are regions or worlds within capital W world. We believe it can be shown that myth presents itself as capital W world and not a world, but we will not take uh, the time to make the case here. Um, C. Hart's 1975. Um, but so there's this this distinction. And um, I think that when we're making the distinction between the earthly and the heavenly and other kinds of big, broad, um, you know, real ontological categories like this, um, I think what earth in this transcendental earth sense, the same kind of earth that um, that Husserl highlights in, in his whole um, topic of the article referred to, um, and then the corresponding notion of the heavenly is, um, is actually well um, encapsulated in that concept of Nicholas of Cusa, the idea of the infinite sphere, because um, there it's really um, this there, there's a, a center and a periphery, you know, the, this um, dialectic of, of centrality and, and of, um, you know, peripheralness that the two um, earth and heaven are attached to. Um, sorry, I, I forgot where I was going with this, that, you know, this worlds and world, I think is, um, is also pretty well expressed in, in terms of the center and the periphery. I guess that was that was the gist of where I was going. I think what, I got what, too complicated. What can, what can, what can, what can, oh, sorry, go ahead, Gordon. Go ahead, well, Gordon. I just want to pick up precisely on on uh, 
on, on what you said, Randy, and and ask a question that if it's if if this sounds like Sunday school, I apologize, but I mean because it takes it out of kind of mixes things up. But I I want to say that given all that and and all of the issues that you point to there, surely any God, not any God, but God can have it any way. That is to say, the foundation of our religious commitments, the foundation of our engagements is not going to rise or fall on the fine-grained parsing of the kinds of distinctions that are implied in the footnote. Mm. That it, one can say, that's too hard for me. But it doesn't change what I know to be true. Now, you can put a S after D in world, if you like. You can, you can do the very hard work of understanding the mathematics associated with many and many universes, which is really a, a game physicists play and others, other physicists think is a waste of time. And surely, one's religious engagement is not going to rise or fall with the antics of a group of physicists over the period of 50 to 100 years in, in, in Western culture. So it can't be like that. That can't be where the action is. And, and ultimately, it can't be where the action is because the God who is great enough to be worshiped for that God, all of that other stuff is child's play. And that God can have it any way she wants it. Uh, uh, so we can't outsmart God, that's clear. And when we go through this, Oh, are we trying to do anything more than figuring God out and saying, ah, now I've got you. <laughs> now, now I know who you are. Uh, that's, <laughs> that can't be. Any God I can figure out is not a God I want to pay any attention to because I'm already there. Um, and, and I don't know what this means for me personally about religious philosophy, about theology, except when I see that it's grounded in that ultimate uh, ignorance. If at the end of the human path, ignorance is not fully embraced, then from my point of view, that path hasn't been quite made long enough because there's still a, present, a, still a pretense of ultimate knowledge. <laughs> Can I come in here a bit? Um, Gord, go ahead though, I, I don't wanna cut you off. Well, no, 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 please do, please do. I, I uh, I want to go back to things that Matt were mentioning because I think I think there is a, what you you are uh, urging on us uh, and uh, and I welcome it, embrace it, is our ignorance and that the uh, because of the utter transcendence of, of God and the incomprehensibility of God and of our necessary finitude in in trying to make sense or bring to mind and, and embrace this infinity, this incomprehensibility and so forth. 
And uh, we're, we're all here old enough to remember maybe that young man up in the upper, my upper right hand corner and maybe Matt, but there was a fellow named Carl Bart who was close huh. to Kierkegaard. And, uh, and he uh, uh, elaborated on uh, some of these themes, maybe not quite as well as Gordon, but he, uh, uh, he, he did a pretty good job. And the, one of his famous words was no to theology, especially to philosophy. And revelation came, you know, in the sacred word. And there was, a, uh, there was all the authority of God in the sacred word. And obedience was the fundamental response. And even though we didn't know what the hell we were assenting to sometimes. Hmm? And so, now what, as, a, as an old Catholic, uh, there was also this guy called Aquinas and Augustine and a lot of bunch of like that. And revelation uh, was given to us uh, to enrich the uh, initial encounter with the incomprehensible. It wasn't, it was, and it was not nothing. Revelation was a fundamental gift, inseparable from this, this con confrontation with that which is of ultimate concern. In fact, it unpacked the unconditioned condition, which was the ultimate concern. And this was a gift. And the chief gift, if I may abbreviate this, was that we're creatures. And that took care of the infinity and the finitude. But it was a gift. And the gift was analytically in the sense of it was a necessary implication in correspondence with gratitude. The life of the, the life of the creature had to be one, as Matt was suggesting, a surpassing gratitude. But with the with the confrontation, with the with the ascent, with the faith-filled act of belief, life was just beginning a new life was just beginning and the and the this new life wasn't separable from the revelation for example the, when the the rich man a young rich man wants to know how do i enter the kingdom of god the two great commandments they are inseparable but all behind it is the gratitude. And what we have then, we have, as Matt suggests, it seems to me, to sustain ourselves and live a life where not, life doesn't end with the acceptance of the presence of God somehow in history. It just begins. And not only that, Revelation suggests that there is a normative way to be a creature, to be grateful, absolutely grateful, and that is through love of God maximally with your whole heart, your whole mind, and all your strength, and your neighbor, and it's, this is inseparable from the first, like yourself. Try it. Hell. Well, the point is here is that, and I'm going to kind of tie this together very quickly, briefly now, what I've been, as in my 86th year, I've grown fond of a 14th century text called The Cloud of Unknown. Yeah. And this, this text, the author of this text, whom we don't know, but it's the founding of what we today call in America, centering prayer. And we have Thomas Burton and a lot of other good teachers on this score. But the the author of this text, some anonymous, perhaps monk, likely monk, has this, a, a letter to this guy who's struggling with this method because this, it's a prayer of silence. It's a prayer that accepts the mind's infinite agency and as infinite aspiration. But because we're in the presence of God, we got to shut up. 
be quiet and listen. Try it for 20 minutes. When we're all distracted, we're flying around and the, the, the cloud gives us tips on how to wrestle with this. And just do it 20 minutes a day. Well, try it. I've been trying it for several years now. I'm all over the place. The 20 minutes goes like that. I thought of somebody saying something to me and I started thinking about it, it's gone. Mm -hmm. But he says to this, this uh, young uh, person uh, who wants to know how he can stay focused, how he can stay concentrated, how he can be a good listener and a grateful listener to God's presence. Think that you're going to die before the 20 minutes are up. This goes back to Gordon's point. There's something about death which we can, we can repress and we're good at it. We have to repress it seemingly, Freud would think so. But that's for a religious person. It brings it all together. So the, somehow the, what is of ultimate concern is about our, our self-concern of our ultimate status, the gift of our being. And the, these are all doctrines and our life is spent trying to, to understand them. But why do we want to understand them? Because as Augustine says that faith seeks understanding, he also suggests that the faith that doesn't seek understanding is, is, is lazy and a very inauthentic form of faith. We need to nourish ourselves with our minds. And, and, and there's, and you, and it's, it's and that's not only as a as a, 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 reliving, a living out of our vocation to be ra as rational be as rational beings, but for the sake of being authentically creatures and grateful creatures and loving creatures. We need that el elucidation of the doctrine or, or elucidation of the revelation to be who we are called to be. So being everybody in some sense should be a theologian is what I get out of this. Gordon's absolutely right. Everything can't hang on some fine, some fine or theological philosophical distinction. But being a creature is not some little thing. The primacy of love in life is not some little thing. The Trinity gets a little different, but when you get a good explanation of the Trinity, I always find it edifying. I find Eckhart's explications of the Trinity wonderful. The whole theme of grace is tied together. And you go back to, to uh, 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 Randy's notion of Cousas, uh, Nicholas uh, Cousanus, uh, uh, the, the absolute sphere, which is everywhere. It's the center and the periphery. That's, the, that's not, uh, uh, Randy, again, that's not Conrad Marxist. This is God he's talking about. Mm -hmm. Because that is a challenge to our thinking, to not be complacent with our thinking. It, our, we're, 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 the mandate to think about God is an extraordinary mandate and we should, we, we should approach it with ut utmost humility. But the whole point of a revelation is, may not be neglected. It's to, it's to enable us to be who we are. And, and, it's, and that, that, that what Gordon's focusing on is, a, is a, a, key, a key theme. How is it possible in our world today of, of, our, of our, you know, our, our Prometheus, Prometheus, Promethean, uh, Nietzschean, uh, uh, Ubermensch, Menschlich, uh, status, mm, that we're beyond human beings. Mm. We are new, new creatures and we're self-defining creatures and we're radically autonomous and so forth. Okay, okay, well, is that so? Hmm? And if it's not so, then what we have to do is to really see the best thing. What is Nietzsche getting at? We are made in the image and likeness of God. We are, we are as close as creatures can get to being God without being God. Oh, could, could you, could I <clears throat> ask you please, and with so much admiration and respect. Uh, that last move, which you uttered with the same intensity and certainty as what you had been saying previously, 
just threw me for a loop. I said, wait a minute, no. where did that come from? Okay, I, I think, I think I, 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 my passion maybe was, was, you know, not properly measured in terms of what I really know, but, but we have, we have revelation itself as a source of that, of that doctrine. Oh, now that's right. And by, oh, by that, but as a philosopher, the phenomenon of Nietzsche, Prometheus, Sartre, are not negligible theological data. The fact of the Luciferian, which I've written several things on in the past year, the, Luc the Luciferian existential, I call it, is not a negligible phenomenological datum. That when I am so angry, for example, and I'm lost with, and, and Sartre has a wonderful analysis of this, I cross the threshold of rage into violence. There's no, there's no tomorrow, there's no yesterday. I live in a, a now that empowers me to be the creator, the decreating creator. In the end of his moral notebook, Sartre talks about this. If you've ever gone there, I don't think it's just because I'm Irish, but I'm capable when I'm really pissed off, I can be just stubbing my toe. I can't find a book, you know, and I enter a, a quasi divine stage. Anything that's in my way, I'm ready to annihilate. The world is not according to my will. <laughs> now these are theological data. And this is where philosophical theology is helpful. But we have history in abundance through, through, uh, the, the, through the, uh, the Luciferian theme runs through history. But we have the, the, the scriptures themselves and we have, we, in, in Jesus of, of Nazareth, we participate in the eternal word of God. We're all created by and participate in and inconceivable as we are without being uh, 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 created, as Paul, as Paul would say, in the eternal word from all eternity. How close can you get to God without being God? So I say that with a passion because I've thought about it. it to, to an atheist, it's bull, bullshit. But this is, but this, this being the kind of creatures we are requires a, a primal virtue of gratitude. Yes. But yes. living out that gratitude, I can't even pray for 20 minutes. So I need tricks. I need, I need dogmas. I need, not, then they're not mere tricks. But I thought this monk's idea, imagine, and don't imagine because it could well be that you don't live out that 20 minutes. I don't know when I'm gone. I know I got maybe three years, but that's a, an aid hmm? to, to as, as Gordon says, to what is really important. What is the ultimate concern? Because we forget, and it's, that's a phenomenon, an interesting phenomenon itself. This truth, the overwhelming truth of a revelation, we can, we can, in our, in our uh, living in uh, 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 what Heidegger calls everydayness, but also what the, the tr tradition hands down as our, fallen state, we can be utterly obtuse to what is of ultimate concern and of the, the knowledge most worth having. And our culture had, has gotten rid of the notion of wisdom and turned it over to, to technology and, and the Wall Street. So I'll be quiet now, but I just want to say that revelation is not a negligible notion, but it, it's incumbent on adult human beings to be theologians of a sort. Okay. Oh, Ellie. I just wanted to, to yeah. all this, what you were speaking earlier about with the um, cloud of unknowing. I mean, one of my takeaways with that book and mysticism in general, Christian mysticism, but anyway, um, is that in order to have a revelation, um, it is about quieting the self and you don't need to study and study and study and be scholarly. If you just quiet yourself, you know, this is what I'm getting from that cloud of unknowing is that God will come to you and give you a revelation. You don't have to uh, 
uh, seek it, it will come to you. And this is another of this sort of like blessing from God or, or, you know, that's one of the things I get from that book. And that I see a lot of overlap with some of the foundations of the Eastern Orthodox Church. Not, and, and I always am very careful because I don't like to denigrate Western, Western Christianity just because of scholasticism and all that stuff. Um, because it's kind of easy to fall into that kind of trap. Oh, well, the Eastern Orthodox Church, you know, you don't need to be scholarly. And, you know, you, if you just practice uh, hesychasm and all this stuff, you know, uh, in other words, you don't have to be learned no. to know God. In fact, to try to be learned takes you farther away from God and all that sort of yeah, discussion. Yeah. But anyway, um, and, and weirdly, I see what um, David put in the chat Somehow I see this related to what we're talking about because it is about this kind of hermeneutic thing where, okay, if you're quiet and meditating and letting God speak to you, and then all of a sudden you're filled with this rapture of love, this gift of love from God, you actually can experience it, you know, the, these various uh, so physiological side effects of meditation and all this stuff. Well, that in itself is you're experiencing self love and all this kind of a thing. So, no, could I just say something about the cloud? Of love? You're absolutely right. The, 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 the it's, it is not a, a, a theological treatise, nor does it encourage trees, uh, theology uh, explicitly. What it's about is prayer, and in the moments of prayer, you're not, uh, you're not the theologian. You're thinking, and what is that attitude that prayer requires? Hmm? And that at, to sustain that attitude is what it's about. You, you have to be quiet. You have to sh shut off your mind's activity. You have to be, you have to not be gazing around. You have to be silent. Hmm? That's why I kind of call it a, 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 a meta or a proto um, phenomenology bracketing. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's well, it's a it's a, it is a, a, it is very close to Buddhism. That one of the uh, teachers of, of the. the uh, Catholic teachers of, of the Jesuit teachers of, Bo of Buddhism is also teaches the cloud. But the point is that faith makes that all possible, you see, and, and a faith is not just an empty act of believing in something, or instead of believing that something, but, but the, the very specific faith with all the doctrines, and he insists on this, hmm, inform that silence, so that you're a creature. And the and all of the all of the ep epithets of a transcendence and 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 God's uh, and the, and the inadequacy of any of our but but we are open to this that we that we are open to this and 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 are in the can be in the presence of this is not only a, a fact as it were a revealed fact and it can't be demonstrated obviously in any normal sense but it's a it's our it's our it's an imperative that we place ourselves in this presence and this will be and this will inform this 20 minutes a day or whatever it is will inform the rest of our life so that we can live out the two great commandments hmm? so this is it's not anti-theology it's not anti-reason it presupposes that as informing because it's, it stands in contrast to what they call the lexio divina the kind of thoughtful prayerful reading of theology and the scriptures that informs this but in this period you're praying to god and god alone and listening to god and you're not chattering or, or praying for anything or praying about anything i bring that all up because the the, the, of the segue with way back to gordon that we are immersed in in uh, selfishness we're immersed in in, in a, a idol, idolized versions of ourselves we're immersed in, in things we uh, give high pri priority to, which is much less important than the unum necessarium, the one thing necessary. Sorry for the Latin, Gordon. And we, uh, the uh, and this is what Blondel, uh, the, uh, the great, much neglected, but the father of, as I think I might have said before, the father of the, father of the Second Vatican Council, hmm? Talk the same thing. We need to be in touch with the unum necessarium because we are always in touch with it, but we repress it. But we, but with a, 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 a teacher like the author of the cloud, is we how do we live out? How do we get in touch with it? This this kind of prayer, not saying the rosary, not even going to sacraments. It, it isn't it isn't diminishing the sacrament, but it is a form of prayer, <coughs> which takes the reality 
of God's ubiquitous presence, hmm, and especially in our be more interior to ourselves than we are in Augustine's phrase. And we live this out for 20 minutes. It's hard to do, but you, how can you do it? How can you take it as serious as, as it requires us to take it? You're going to die. And what about that? When you're on your deathbed, will you have, will you have regretted not spending at least this pittance of a time to be seriously a creature and grateful for your creatureliness? So I, I just wanted to bring together that faith is not, for, uh, revelation is not foreign to faith. Faith is absolutely necessary, but it's such an overwhelmingly rich experience that we're not capable of experience. We reduce it to, to the propositions of a creed. And we, and, but those propositions of a creed, if they are properly soaked in, dwelled on, contemplated they enrich our life they don't distract they don't diminish faith they can only if the if the if the, the worst sense of scholasticism is of course they think that what they're doing is 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 the most important thing a religious person can do but the best ones weren't like that aquinas wasn't like that um if i can just bring this back um to a certain <coughs> theme in the text um and and I think I can I can do this by way of um, offering yet another um, kind of thought experiment. I I didn't know about the centering prayer. I think that is that is so cool it's, as a as a thought experiment to um, you know um, to to invoke the presence you know of this matter of ultimate concern or or whatever you want to call this God you know um, uh, so I mean that's. That's really cool. I, I had a sort of religious experience at that um, at that key moment of of the uh, you know teenage years when when one is experimenting and and uh, having far out experiences and such, right? <laughs> um, when um, in the accounts of like Edith Stein's conversion at Conrad Martius's house, um, and in like uh, Gerda Walther's religious experience, um, when her when her father passed away, when she was on the train, she had this this experience when she got home. Um, in these accounts, you know, it's it's really something that transcends thought in the in the in the normal you know sense of like. Um, reasoning things out uh, dianoetically or according to like propositions in a rational sort of way, of course, right? And, and this we find in, in these themes of like um, the Pascalian heart um, that has its own reasons and, and, and in all of these um, religious theological contexts, well, you know, the experience of that conversion or revelation, you know, that religious experience um, as generalizable as it as it might um, be, you know, is something that these thought experiments are are like devices that we can use to have that experience, right? In in our meditation, be it um, contemplative or um, you know non cognitive or whatever you want to, you know, however you want to divide it up, and in um, in the text at the beginning of seven two, there's a quote by Eliada that I think gets to the, the theme of the sky heaven in a, a really cool way by um, highlighting um, one route to this experience. Um, uh, Richard Albert, uh, Richard Alpert, um, AKA Baba Ram Das, um, has this hilarious, awesome quote, um, America, I, I don't know if I'm getting it right. America is a materialist country, a materialist nation and um, wanted its God in material form. And, and hence we got LSD. <laughs> um, so I, I find um, what for me was especially fruitful in um, provoking the religious experience was a perceptual key. Um, you know, maybe because we're in a very like, you know, um, sense overstimulated culture, whatever. I don't know. I just find that having um, something that you can actually look at, like a kind of yantra or mandala, um, you know, to, um, to bring that presence of the divine to the fore and even penetrate your, your mind and, and emotions and everything and, and have that religious experience, that revelation, um, I find really is there in, um, in the heavens and not just in the perceptual phenomena, of the heavens, but in the reality 
of the all encompassing all surrounding um, depth, you know, um, which you can kind of experience as outer space, you know, and, and knowing that that's where you are, that it's it's running throughout you and everything. Um, so I just wanted to show us this quote real quick. I, it's a really long quote. I don't think we should read the whole thing, but um, but I can bring it up. And if we can just look at the co first couple sentences, I think it really um, is captured there. What so here, um, it says, there is no need to look into the teachings of myth to see that sky itself directly reveals a transcendence, a power, and a holiness. Merely contemplating the vault of heaven produces a religious experience in the primitive mind. This does not necessarily imply a nature worship of the sky. To the primitive, nature is never purely natural. The phrase contemplating the vault of heaven really means something when it is applied to primitive man, receptive to the miracles of the everyday, to an extent we find it hard to imagine. Such contemplation is the same as a revelation. So I just wanted to, to highlight um, this point. Never mind what he says about the primitive. Um, you know, that's us. We're primitive. And um, the point is that there's a, a receptivity. He might be building on the whole um, the thesis that, you know, in, in earlier times, we had a, a more primitive. Um, Can I say, I, I want to yeah. come in because I know what he thinks there. Yeah. He has provided us with, he being Eliana, the ontology of what he called, or what we, come, what we moderns call primitive religions. But in no way was it primitive in any derogatory sense for them. In fact, he is a Russian Orthodox himself. He saw, and in, in Roman Catholicism, in fact, he ran a critique of Protestantism that he felt that they were not good, capable of being good, sensitive readers of the history of religion because they had uh, excised sacramentalism. They, they excise the, the visibility, the, the tangibility, the earthliness of religion from religion in terms of a more pure spirituality. This was, this, uh, he says, as an anecdotal statement that he just felt they were hard, Protestants couldn't tune in to the history of religions because it was foreign to the religiosity. Now, obviously, he wasn't saying that there shouldn't have been a Reformation or something like that. Hmm? But or that the, the Christianity doesn't need re constant reforming, as, as as I think we'd all agree to, hmm? as and as one of the popes said, hmm? uh, that it, it, it's semper reformandum it must be re always being reformed. Hmm? But uh, the, the Eliade is primitive is not to be taken in a, a diminutive derogatory way. There was a wisdom there, which you're pointing to, it, Randy. Yeah, you know, this is something that's accessible to all, <laughs> you know, um, the heavens above. And, and I feel like it's really, um, it's, it's not just a, a thought experiment, you know, it's, it is a thought experiment, it works as a heuristic device for the meditation for the experience. But it's, it's the reality um, of the, the sheer immensity of any celestial object, the earth itself as a totality, um, you know, or any of the objects, but beyond all the objects, beyond the, the horizon as it appears to us in, in the periphery when we're, when we're, we're laying, um, you know, on the grass looking up, this, this is what I experienced, um, you know, it, it, it just, it, it was such a, a powerful, um, really conversion experience that made me, um, it, it, it then recalibrated my, my paradigm and my accepted doctrine and, and everything, you know, um, I was reading Franklin Merrill Wolf's literature at the time, um, Pathways Through to Space and Philosophy of Consciousness Without an Object, uh, when I had this, this experience. And then I found that um, looking at the heavens, you know, and, and contemplating the void beyond the stars, which is, in other words, this um, sphere of the all, you know, beyond the sphere of the fixed stars, eighth sphere or however it's enumerated in the old cosmologies, um, and this then I found um, really well put in a little quote by um, our professor at Stony Brook, Matt, Matt knows him, um, Peter Manchester, who passed away in uh, 2015. But um, there's a, a quote in one of his, one of his books. Um, if I could just point us to this real quick, it's a really, um, I think really powerful quote. I, I wrote, I shared it in, um, in this article. Um, 
so this quote down here, what is the experience of coming down from eternity with time? Since astronomy has provided so many key ideas in this connection, we try again a meditation on the sky. It is like the ecstatic apprehension in which prostrate beneath the hemisphere of heaven to which our vision is at any time restricted as much by the one-sidedness of our gaze as by the earth that interposes between ascendant and descendant hemispheres, we suddenly complete the sphere in imagination, surround ourselves with wholeness, intuit not just the two of time, but the one of eternity and find ourselves concentric with its all-inclusiveness and finality. The heaven opens around us as an abyss into which we are falling. It is the dizzying abandon to this all at once now that is the true exaltation of the religious experience of eternity and time. This is a, a very nice, lovely text, but it, it, uh, I, when we later on in this chapter, we, uh, uh, you know, we wrestle with the inevitable eroding of this kind of spontaneous apprehension. Uh, because once you're talking to somebody on the moon, and once I saw the documentary of uh, Nature Nova or something this past week, I don't know if any of you saw it on the black hole. I mean, all these young people were, you know, dancing up and down celebrating, which I thought was a, 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 a litany of, of, of bad poetic expressions uh, uh, celebrating chaos. And and something that nobody knew what they were talking about. I'm so sorry. I, that was my that was my impression of this program, uh, but I was, couldn't help but think of Conrad Marx's Hellenic sphere, where you have the this infinite the, the infinite divisibility suddenly becoming demonic and swallowing up all of space. And uh, and I don't know what she would have made of the black hole. Uh, I think, but it's, it sounds very much like her. But that, uh, was short, long and short of it, Randy, is <clears throat> that lovely sacramentalizing of 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 the, of the perceptual world in, in terms of heaven and, and earth hmm, is being undermined when you listen to cosmology, modern cosmology, in a way it wouldn't have been un undermined, say, in the 14th, 13th century, when you looked up the sky. Uh, something like C.S. Lewis says, what would you see? You wouldn't see what Pascal saw, you know, this empty space full of God knows what, literally. You'd be open, you'd see a party going on. Hmm? And spiritual beings having a, a jam, pushing stars around. Hmm? Yeah. It'd be a, a, a marvelous, you know, a, a, a celebration. But that, but it, that would be, think of what, if, if, uh, if the 14th century admirer of the sky were to suddenly uh, you know, be teletransported into, you know, a computer machine or a telephone and start talking to a friend who's talking to them from Jupiter. You know, it would be, it would be a homogenization of space. Hmm? But then if you added the whole weird cosmology of the, I'm not saying weird in the sense it's false writing, but it, it certainly isn't for me edifying the immensity of space. Is creepy. My wife had, uh, you know, did a, a pot trip uh, with on uh, uh, when she was a kid, and 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 uh, you know had a sense of the immensity of space, and realized that the, her that she was on the Earth on the surface of the Earth. The Earth was turning, and she was going to be pulled off into space, you know, by gravitational force of the surrounding planets, and that was a creepy trip, you know. So, but that's. That it's, it's an interesting hermeneutical issue in what sense, and this is what we, you know, we try to wrestle with, but what sense is that heaven and earth uh, 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 seemingly part of, as part of the life world uh, permanent fixture? And that I think Bill was asking about that earlier too, you know, in terms of a comparative history of religions, because I think with, it'll be, a, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, it's undergoing radical revision, mm -hmm. uh, our sense of space. Uh, when you when you think that you know you, you, you we have people have people walking on the moon, what what, what that what meant for 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 uh, what that would mean in terms of the of anybody who who was uh, say a, a primitive mm, in Eliade's sense uh, 
what that would meant for mean that for their worldview because it's already eroding our worldview. Right, but so you say in here somewhere, um, you know, that there's something in Husserlian transcendental phenomenology that resists um, the the Newtonian uh, relativizing of all of space and time, right, or at least of space. Um, you know, and that's the um, found in in the Husserlian theme of like the 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 trend. I can't hear you. Can't can't hear you, Randy. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, oh, we got you now. Yeah. Well, th so there's the Copernican revolution, right? But then there's the second Copernican revolution of transcendental philosophy, of Kant, you know, um, of this Cartesian reorientation to the the the, the cogito, oh. right? And and um and this whole transcendental philosophy of cogito and cogitata of noesis and noemata and um you know the the the, uh, the earth and the heavens you know might be um attached to the actual experience of the earth and the heavens from our perspective at this time but um but ever present whether we're on the moon or on mars or, or whatever you know is um a central and peripheral orientation. And I think that's the real point of the second Copernican revolution. The idea of transcendental philosophy is, um, is that indeed there is a kind of absoluteness, um, not an absolute, you know, in the, the metric or pyric space-time sense, the, the like Newtonian absolute, or maybe it's a new version of the Newtonian absolute, but I mean, you know, the, the, the infinite sphere and the, the center or the, or the center and the periphery or however it's put, you know, I feel like really is um, an adherence to, instead of a, a radical deconstruction of this, um, this orientation system of like the cosmos of, of various stories, you know, in multiple spheres. Um, I think it's getting late. That's a good question. Um, maybe we could, you know, talk, begin next time uh, about that. Uh, I, I, uh, I, yeah, I, I mean, we should definitely um, wrap it up. Uh, there is, there's one more theme I was hoping we could we could touch on briefly, and I know you've written on this, Jim, um, in in other um, in other locations. But at the very end of the essay, just before the William Carlos Williams um, quote in the last paragraph, there, there's this theme of a, a longing for the remote in the German Romantics. Mm. Uh, you know this this remote being a kind of um, experience as, as a longing, a longing to go back to a lost homeland, a nostalgia for a lost paradise. And um, I know you've written about nostalgia and such. Um, I mean, we, we should go, but I, I just wanted to bring up this theme as well, because um, I think this is also found in a lot of this kind of- Oh yeah, it, it's just that we are, you know, we. Uh... And your question is a good one, and I, I strive to make a case for something, per, something, kind of the permanence, permanence of the heaven earth kind of structure tied to the life world. But it's, I, I must say that it's kind of wobbly, and and that the, uh, uh, and but I, I think that the the uh, and Conrad Marx is trying to not tie it so much to a, a transcendental phenomenological analysis, but to a real ontological cosmology and uh, so that's it's, a, it's not quite the same thing uh, and, and what Husserl, Husserl I think would uh, you know not be so interested in this as far as I know uh, I'm not sure I you know his that essay he wrote on heaven and earth uh, that was prior to space shots and you know uh, moonwalkings right. and and things like that uh, it's in the point the hermeneutical point there is that when they when our the continuity of our life world extends itself to the heavenly bodies mm, so that they don't have this heterogeneous dimension of an absolute up. They still seem to see me up. They don't seem to hover. You know, it's not like a, they're not like balloons in our world. Mm. They seem to be absolutely distant, absolutely apart. But that's, that's really eroding. That's really decomposing, it seems to me, with, with our 
with our space research. And, and yeah. uh, so the, 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 uh, the kind of aeonic world periphery is part of a, of a picture of the life world, which I pushed for here. I'm not sure that that is not a, 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 a matter of time before that erodes or you know, vanishes uh, as, as, a, as a, a possible potential sacramental image you know, of what's ultimate. I just don't know. Uh, but that has nothing to do with the merits and demerits, demerits of Conrad Marx's effort, you know, to to account for the sources of nature in radically different categories than either the Newtonian or uh, or uh, uh, some versions of Einsteinian. Uh, but if you all get a chance to, I would like to share uh, hear hear what you have to think of, say about that. Uh, show that uh, there was just a no over nature the other night. Uh, Matt can't get probably in Germany, but the on, on the black hole. I mean, I just found it conceptually hard to put it all together, and the desperate grabbing after metaphor after metaphor uh, to to talk about these things and then make it sound like it was something they all were sure that they knew. This, if I'm guilty of it, uh, Gordon, those folks, those young folks, were talking about things that they seemed to know about, and not only that, they were willing to orient their whole life world around this utterly strange monstrous chaos that was going to swallow up and accounting for the earth at the same time destroying everything. I, I, don't, I don't know anything about that that show, but whatever it is, I'm sure you and they are not walking down the same street. <laughs> so this is called Monster Black Hole, right? No, it was just Black Hole. It was just about the black hole. This nature or Nova. Okay. And I might be wrong on that. I appreciate us having someone critique my critique. But my critique was I didn't think, I didn't understand what they were talking about. And I was convinced that they didn't either. But right. that's, that's rude of me to say that. Well, well listen, I, it is time to go. I just want to thank everyone for a really wonderful couple of hours. Well, thank and you. I would say the same thing. Very good. Thinking and thanking all of us, yes. <laughs> Um, so we're going to have, an, I, I hope, another two meetings before the year is over, before the book is up. Um, and, and we could just do the rest of the book at this point in the next meeting and then have that, that additional meeting to continue talking about this. Um, there's a concluding chapter, which is, which is just a section. It's just a, few, a couple pages, really. Oh. And then um, the introduction to and the excerpt of the metaphysics of the earthly. Um, I think it would be really cool to, we, we can't pass up. Yeah, they all, all fit together very, pretty much. I don't say they don't fit together well, but they fit together. Uh, yeah. In terms of what we're talking about, is right. there, is the heaven earthly categorization something that we want to say is, is, a, is, is our essential categories of the life world or of the real world, the real, real ontological world? Yeah. Those aren't the same either. Well, and, and also to, to bring back what we what we opened with the um the theme of like two spheres or two totally separate regions i i also you know i've heard arguments and as, as well as in this book that um transcendental phenomenology aka transcendental idealism and um the the realism an uh, aka real ontology you know um which caused this schism at the time in in the history of early phenomenology um might very well come together and might, in fact, that could be the plan all along. I know in um, analyses of passive and active synthesis, Husserl, at least my reading of it, is that that's the plan for the transcendental sciences to advance to the point where they could resume all the ontological, um, you know, and, and at the center of ontological, real ontological uh, framework and and become one, you know, in this in this new transcendental um, universal science, he calls it. Um, yeah. So, I, I, you know, that's one way of putting them together. Now, she wrote an essay shortly before she died, trying to bring phenomena, trans, Husserl and her, herself together. No one else has worked on that, and and it's it's still a, you know, an aspiration. And uh, but the, the chief thing was that the logos that Husserl uncovers cannot be different than the logos she uncovers. But how do you get them together? They have to be the same logos. Mm -hmm. But there's no, it, 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 I don't know how this would fit in with the 
heaven and earth issue explicitly. You know, it's a, it would, it's a, a, a expression of hope uh, or a, a necessary postulate because of course they would not be different. Mm. But uh, the only, only way I think that they could be conjoined is we had a richer notion of the transcendental I as a, somehow the source of logos. Mm. But I, I'm not sure about, and, and then the Alan Louis Lavelle, for example, that the, 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 the transcendence which we aspire to is not without, but within. Or there's, that's, that's uh, say that would be a, a kind of Vedantin uh, Upanishad inversion of the, of the issue. So All right. I'll be quiet. I don't know what I'm talking about. Well, in, in that spirit of, of ignorance, let us meditate on the logos. <laughs> yeah, and okay. All right. Part. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. Good seeing you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Good talking with you.